Hello everyone and welcome to another session on application of moving load in STAT. I am Surajit Ghosh and in this video, I will discuss how we can apply a train load on a gantry girder using vehicle definition and moving load generator. If there is any warning related to the moving load, how to interpret that message and accordingly fix the problem, that will be covered in detail. In last fourth part of this series, I have discussed about the basic concept of moving load and how we can use this feature to apply one or multiple vehicle load on a bridge deck. Another major application of this moving load feature is to simulate a crane load which travels on a gantry girder. In any industrial, manufacturing or warehouse structure, overhead cranes are commonly used to lift and move heavy item. Depending on the plant size, there might be a single crane or multiple cranes working parallelly. Also, there are different types of EOT crane, different configuration of wheel and crane gutter, movement of trolley, and based on all this factor, crane wheel load varies. For gantry gutter design, we need to find out the optimum section which can sustain the maximum wheel load applied from the crane. Check the second part of this series for more details. In general, crane wheel load is calculated considering the cell point of crane gutter plus the lifting capacity and this is applied on the gantry in vertically downward direction. But when a crane moves in the longitudinal or transverse direction, few horizontal force components are applied on the gantry. For example, when the crane starts to move or stops at any location, a sudden thrust is applied on the rail from wheel in the direction of movement. This axial load should be considered during gantry design. So, crane load is not only a vertical load component, rather a combination of vertical wheel load, horizontal load and an axial thrust. Intensity of this load depends on the total wheel load. Normally, 10 to 20 percent of total vertical load is considered in the horizontal direction and 5 to 10 percent load is considered as an axial thrust. For proper analysis and design of gantry girder, including bracket connections, we need to consider all these force components. How we can apply this horizontal load along with the moving load? That will be covered in the next video. Consider this model. It is a warehouse with 54 meter length and 25 meter width. Web tapered sections are assigned to the rafter and column member. How we can easily generate the tapered mainframe member along with secondary member like purlin and bracing with proper offset and axial specification? That is already covered in the PEB series. A 20 ton EOT crane will be installed in this warehouse and I want to design all the members including gantry girder considering the crane load. This crane is supported on two gantry girder throughout the length. A custom user-defined section with higher depth is assigned to this gantry. We will optimize this section later. Few brackets are used to support this member. For any gantry girder design, there are few approximate method. By considering a static wheel load with maximum intensity on the gantry girder, location of which is determined using an empirical equation or by modeling the girder as a simply supported member for moving load application. Neither of this approach provide accurate result as effect of crane movement on the entire structure is not considered during analysis. It is always better to model the gantry girder along with the main structure and apply the crane load as moving load at close interval. We can further review the analysis result to get the worst effect on the structure. To apply a crane load, there are two steps. First, we need to generate a crane definition with proper wheel load, axle distance and width. Then apply this load at fixed interval. For this crane, there are two set of wheels with equal wheel load of 160 kN. First value represents the wheel load of the rearmost wheel. Distance between the wheel is 3 meter and with this 23.3 meter, which is the center to center distance of the gantry girder on which this crane will move. Once the vehicle definition is generated, 
then we can apply this load on the gantry. In this model, I have already included two seismic load from X and Z direction, one dead and one live load case. Now I want to add a moving load case based on this crane definition. For that, we need the load count which is required to cover the entire length. This is calculated based on the travelling distance of any wheel and load increment value. By the way, travelling distance is not same as the total length of the structure. For this model, length of the girder is 54 meter, but this crane will not travel from one end to other. Normally, a buffer is installed few meter before the end point, beyond which train will not move due to safety issue. For this model, this distance is 1 meter in both side. Effective distance is 52 meter. To calculate the total traveling distance of the crane, we need the initial and final position of any wheel, say the rear wheel. This is the initial position of the crane and crane movement will stop when the front wheel touch this point. For this final position, rear wheel is 3 meter behind. So the total traveling distance of the rear wheel is 49 meter. I want to generate the moving load at 1 meter interval. Based on this equation, we can calculate the load count required to cover this length, which is 50. This concept along with all the basics of vehicle definition and load generation are already covered in the first four part of this series. You can check that for more details. I don't want to add any other load with this crane load, but if required, we can add any predefined load case like dead load along with the crane load. Next, we need to define the initial position of the load and the direction of movement. We have only one vehicle definition, which refers to the crane load. No range information is required for this model. This crane will move in the global Z direction with 1 meter interval. So we need to specify Z increment as 1. No X increment is required. Most important input is the initial position of the load, which refers to the location of the rear right wheel. In the previous sessions, I have covered how the coordinates are calculated based on the initial position of the rear wheel of a truck. Same logic can be followed here. For starting position of the crane, rear wheel is located 1 meter before the end of gantry. Coordinate of this point is 0 0.85, 5.667 and 0. So initial position of this wheel should be 0 0.85 in x, 5.667 in y and 1 in z, right? Well, there is one problem with this value that I will discuss at the end. This model is now ready for moving load analysis. After analysis, we can notice that there are several warning message. I will review this later. First, I want to confirm whether the moving load is generated properly or not. From the load page, we can check the initial position and direction of the crane, which is represented with a red line. This red box refers to the initial coordinate of the rear wheel, which seems right. Also, span of the crane is considered correctly. Now check the generated loads. We can switch on the load view and select any generated load case. See, there is some problem with this moving load. No load is applied on the structure for any generated load case, which means with our input, no moving load is generated. To get an idea why the load generation failed, we can explore the warnings reported in the output file. There are exactly 50 warnings, one for each moving load case. And it informs that program is unable to find any member at the specified Y location. We have defined the initial Y coordinate as 5.667. Same is mentioned in the node tooltip. If we review the geometry page, and select any node on the gantry girder. See, same Y coordinate is mentioned here. So our input is correct and there are several member present at this level. Then 
what is the problem? Check the same node coordinate from the input editor for node 200. The Y coordinate is different from the UI. It is not 5.667. This is the actual node coordinate, but due to decimal place setting in the UI, this value is modified to 3 digit in the node table. As we have defined that modified coordinate, program is unable to find any member at this location. No member is present at 5.667 meter. We need to use this Y value. This is very common when the model is imported from any DXF file or generated using any macro. I always recommend checking the coordinate from the input editor or set higher decimal place in the UI. For this moving load, we need to change the Y coordinate. Once again, analyze this structure. Now there is no warning. We can check the generated loads from the load page. This time, all the moving loads are generated properly. It starts from the initial position, moves in the Z direction with 1 meter interval, and travel till the front wheel is 1 meter apart from the end of gantry gutter. This is the last load case. So, based on our assumption, Loads are generated correctly, but we cannot use the analysis result of this moving load for gantry gutter design. We need to include load from the horizontal and axial detection along with the vertical load. In the moving load window, there is no option available to combine this vertical load with other components, but there is an alternative method by which we can add a factor load in any horizontal direction and combine this moving load with other load case. That will be covered in the next video. Stay tuned.